Good afternoon. My name is Jude Hijar. I'm a clinical immunologist in the Division of Allergy and Immunology in the Department of Pediatrics at Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. As I mentioned, I'm a clinical immunologist who takes care of patients with primary immunodeficiency disorders that we now referred to as inborn errors of immunity. My clinical interest is definitely focused on uh, patients with immunodeficiency disorders, and my clinical research is focused on improving the outcomes of patients with immunodeficiency disorders. And my translational research work is focused on how to link the microbiome to immune responses in patients with immunodeficiencies. Today, I'm joined by one of my patients, Megan. And during our discussion, we hope to elucidate insights on factors that affect the health-related quality of life of patients with primary immunodeficiencies and how patients can have more agency over their health and health outcomes. Thank you for joining me, Megan. Thank you for inviting me, Dr. Hajar. I know we've talked about quality of life in my life, and so I appreciate having the opportunity in this forum to talk about it a little bit more and to share my experiences. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. So Megan, from your perspective, how does health-related quality of life mean to you? Well, health-related quality of life, there's the quality of life and then health-related quality of life. To me, it's my view of how happy or content I am with my health, both my physical health as well as my mental health. And it really does consider how my health impacts the activities of daily life, including work and professional responsibilities, or even volunteerism and those that work that I may be doing unpaid. It also is about the quality of life and the comfort I have with the physical activities of spending time with family and friends and doing the activities, even of homekeeping and all those things that just have to be done at home, like preparing meals for myself and family members. It's also about engaging in my broader community and just doing the activities I personally consider fun, like hobbies or exercise. But I'd be remiss to say it also considers, do I have access to the healthcare providers who ask me about how I'm feeling, and are willing to spend time talking about my overall well-being, both physical and mental. This is really a beautiful description. And really what you have described is the general translation of what is now scientifically very acceptable ways to measure health-related quality of life. So if we want to look scientifically at uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we see that they define health-related quality of life as an individual or a group's perceived physical and mental health over time. And there are now validated questionnaires to measure quality of life in general populations, as well as in specific diseases like immunodeficiency disorders. Those questionnaires usually focus on pain, depression, anxiety, ability to sleep, vitality, and the cause, duration, and severity of a current activity limitation that an individual may have in his or her life because of the specific disease that we are looking at. So what you have described really encompasses all those different aspects that uh, scientifically we try to gauge by our questionnaires. So Thinking about all of this, how important would you guess health-related quality of life is in primary immunodeficiency disorders? Well, if you asked me this question more than 20 years ago, when I was first diagnosed, I would have probably brushed it off and said it's not that important. But over time, and I would say particularly in the last five years, as I've perhaps grown older and wiser and had had more life experiences, I've learned that quality of life is critical. My view of my own health and quality of life creates a real environment that envelops my whole well-being. There's often a saying that's used that says perception is reality, which means the mental 
impression you have of something defines how you see that something, regardless of the truth. If you take a look at my medical history and take a look at all my labs, you might say as a patient, I'm somewhat of a complex mess. But my perception of my situation is, yes, I'm complex, but with the right tools and resources, and that includes a team of healthcare professionals, along with my personal commitment to my health, that complexity can be managed. You know what you said, Megan, is very, very true and very important. And it really touches upon two instinct, actually, and two distinct features of measuring the impact of disease on patients. So what you described first about how the disease has affected you is really a true reflection of quality of life. And in the past years, there were studies that were done in Europe and then in the U.S. that tried to evaluate what does it mean to have have a good or a poor quality of life on patients. For example, in Italy, they took a group of patients with common variable immunodeficiency disorders. They followed them for six years and they measured their quality of life using a very specific questionnaire at baseline of recruitment one year later and then six years later. During that period of time, some patients died. And when they went back and looked at the patients who died, they found that those patients actually scored really low on their health-related quality of life questionnaires. So they concluded that truly the patients who had the disease had a major impact on their quality of life really almost predicted that the disease will shorten their life as well. But on the flip side of this, they found out that by modeling bioinformatically those information, you can see that if you work on improving the quality of life of patients, you actually can improve the survival of those patients just by touching upon certain factors that affect the quality of life without necessarily directly impacting the disease activity itself. So that was very, very important. On the flip side, when you said you're perception is reality, you touched upon a very important another aspect of how disease affects patients, which what we call our self-perceived health. The self-perceived health is a little bit different from health-related quality of life, in which in health-related quality of life, patients subconsciously think about more the mental health of them in relation to the disease, versus health-related quality of life, they think about the physical impact of the disease on their daily life. And I think each aspect and each uh, component is very, very important. And we have to learn as providers and scientists to include both because they both complement each other as we try to improve impacts of the patients. So I wanted to ask you a few questions about your perception of your own health. So if I had to ask you the general question, how do you feel today or how were you feeling in the past few months? What does this mean to you? I would always answer. And even when I'm looking at surveys that they ask of how do you rate your health? I always rate it as very good to excellent, even with my immune deficiency diagnosis. That's wonderful. If we are to look at the reasons that you rate your health as good or excellent, despite the fact that you have described your medical chart as a complex medical chart, what would you say some of the factors that make you think that your health is good or excellent? Well, I think it's through my personal commitment to my medical therapy plan. That's just be, my medical therapy and my immunoglobulin infusions are just a, a weekly part of my life and have been for many years. I know that when I'm adhering to that schedule, that keeps me healthy. But it's also a focus on things like diet and exercise and good mental health practices. And I even put sleep in that category of good mental health practices. Over time, as I've even grown older, I've learned that I have to manage not only my time, but also my energy and do the things that are most important to me when I have the most energy and figure out how to do those other activities on, say, D 
down days. You know, over time and over the past 20, almost 22 years, my health has had ups and downs. There have been good periods of time and bad periods of time. But even at I look at those, you know, rougher spots, many times the good hours have even outweighed the bad hours. So I have to put all of it in perspective and say, it is likely because I have adopted practices that have helped me frame my perspective about my health and know that there are things that I can do to influence my health, like diet and exercise. And it's through that I've taught myself that I'm a resilient person. I think resiliency is really key as a person living with chronic disease and chronic illness, learning that just because you have a down period, you can get back up and learning and how to focus on the techniques that will help you do that really helps in terms of long-term living with a chronic illness. That's really wonderful description of how you perceive your health and how you feel that you actually can have control over some aspects of your health. And I wanted to ask you about this in more details and ask you, what are some of the things that you feel are in your control when you think about your immunodeficiency disorder? Well, as I described, some things that I think that are in my control that really help me make the best of my diagnosis is having options when it comes even to my immunoglobulin therapy plan. I like having the flexibility of my immunoglobulin treatment that I use today. I can schedule it based on my own schedule and make it fit into my life. So that's an aspect of control that is very important to me. There's other things that I've learned that are simple things that feeling in control of my medical side of life and my health are even keeping track of important information related to my own personal health. That means I have a file with a lot of documentation of diagnosis and physicians and phone numbers and prescriptions and vitamins and supplements that I take. But when I go see a new doctor, I very much feel in control of the situation because I have all of this information in front of me and I don't have to doubt myself at any point. I just know I have everything in front of me that are usually the typical questions I'm asked with a new healthcare provider. Those are all little things that help me feel in control. Then I can even think of other simple things that sometimes from a mental health standpoint, make me feel in control. That may be, we talked about diet in terms of nutrition a little bit, but I will take social media diets or do things just to get away from the news or things that you might not consider a diet like that. An easy thing when sometimes I feel like everything is out of control in my digital life is even click unsubscribe. There's a lot of power in that little one click of unsubscribe to clean out my digital life. That's really very important. Every single uh, factor that you have described has been scientifically validated and proven to be a serious, impactful factor in how people perceive their health and how they feel that being in control or not in control of their health really impacts how they perceive their health overall. So. If I want to summarize this from the medical publications, you know, perspective, we think about health perception as an individual personal beliefs and statements regarding their health status. And it's, although subjective term, it's really a strong indicator that reflects the physical, mental, and social well-being. And when we look at those factors that impact, they encompass multiple factors that you've described, like the perceived stress. So when you feel that, okay, disease is going to impact my life. How is my employer going to think about it? How are my family are going to deal with it? That really adds to the burden of the disease on you. Other factors that you mentioned, like balancing activities and even energy is something that people had to deal with. The social stress, we should add to it, the social media stress that you just mentioned is big. 
And an important factor that was brought up as well is the relationship with the professional. So you coming, being prepared with your medication list and your supplements and your schedules definitely gives you control over those issues that would in general influence even the long bottom line of having the illness and the disease. And finally, the physical activity. So I wanted to ask you about some of those factors and delve into those in in more details. So uh, what in those factors that I mentioned you would consider are the most important factors that you personally think affected how you perceive your health? The one you mentioned about balancing activities and figuring out how to manage just living all of those activities of daily life with rest. I can say I was not a person who really subscribed. I'm always a go, go, go person. But I have learned over time that that rest is really important for my mental health and quality of sleep is very important for my mental health. And I've learned about as I mentioned earlier, of managing my energy and really figuring out how I go with the the waves and troughs of chronic illness, learning how to ride those waves and really figure out things that work well for me and things to do when I am feeling great. I've even learned benefit my family, like preparing meals ahead of time and putting things in the freezer. So on those periods of time when I'm in the trough, of feeling low on energy, well, we don't have to worry about meals and something can come out of the freezer. But i it's just that balancing that has been key for me to figure out that I can live a really good quality of life and focus on the long term, not just the short term. That's very important. And, and definitely having a Good planning and being resilient is definitely an important aspect of having a chronic illness, particularly in immunodeficiency, and you have where you have to battle multiple fronts. You know the infections, the medications, the fatigue that can come to it. So there are certainly a lot of things that we advise our patients, and some techniques that we advise them to do that hopefully will help allow them to to have a good quality of life living with chronic illness like immunodeficiency. So you probably heard this from me a lot about being physically active and getting exposed to sunlight that have been shown to to help with being more active and more fit. Other factors that you have already mentioned, like diet and exercise, you've already mentioned things like having access to immunoglobulin therapy and uh, even access to doctors, as you said earlier, that will evaluate your health have all been factors that shown to directly impact the quality of life, specifically in immunodeficiency. So among those factors, what do you think from your perspective were the most important to you living with with immunodeficiency? Well, I sometimes wish more patients in our community would hear your messages about getting good morning light and the importance of physical activity. I know exercise is kind of like a bad word to a lot of people. And it really, to me, I've learned how important that the more I exercise, the more energy I have. Now, this comes from me being a person who, in elementary school physical education, I was never the first one picked for the kickball team. I might have been even the one of the last people picked for the kickball team. But keeping that in mind, I've learned that exercise has many forms, especially as an adult. And I can find something that really fits into my life and makes it easy for me to get the energy that comes from more physical activity. For me, it's walking. And I've developed a really good habit of every morning, nearly rain or shine, getting out, walking in my neighborhood and at the adjacent park. I've learned that habits can be good habits like exercise. And I've learned if I do things first thing in the morning, it's going to stay a priority. Fewer things are going to get in the way. I've learned how to make things a habit of even getting clothes out the night before and have my 
tennis shoes right by the back door where I'm leaving from. And I've learned that even on days that I maybe not feeling great health wise, getting out and getting outside, getting fresh air gives me fresh perspective. I even find that those periods of time when I am not feeling great are the days that I may need that most. So I've learned how to put physical activity into my life, make it fit in my life, and have reaped the benefits with more energy. That's beautifully put. So we've talked about the physical function, but how about the social function for you as an individual with immunodeficiency? Do you feel socially connected? Certainly, I feel socially connected through my colleagues and friends, just that I've always had that have been a part of my life. I've been fortunate that I have been able to share my primary immunodeficiency disease journey with many people in my close professional and personal circle. I have been fortunate that I have felt to be in a safe environment where I could share that. And so, Those individuals have supported me in good times and in bad. But I also think it is through those social interactions, both physical interactions with people in my community, as well as just my commitment to my community and the organizations that are important to me, is where I get a lot of personal rewards or gratification from sharing, you know, my knowledge, experience, and talents with others. How about patient advocacy groups? Have conferences you attend, you know, affected you in any way, make you feel that you can relate to your situation? So certainly, I will admit that in the first seven or so years of my diagnosis, I was pretty much out on an island. I very much accepted my primary immunodeficiency diagnosis, but I really had not that much education on my diagnosis. It was when there was a major change in my health, coupled with the need to change physicians and find a new immunologist, that I learned about the Immune Deficiency Foundation, which is the National Patient Advocacy Organization for patients living with immune deficiencies. And it was in 2009 when I went to my first Immune Deficiency Foundation National Conference, where I met someone living with my same diagnosis. And I was quite surprised. There was a convention hall filled with people with a similar diagnosis. And I was not alone anymore. And I was getting education that was very relevant to me. And I was just amazed at the connection points I was making with other people and really even finding like-minded people, persons my age who were out working and living their lives with an immune deficiency. So I've been fortunate to attend the Immune Deficiency Foundation's national conferences, as well as many of their local events. And many of their events have pivoted to an online Zoom format so I can take part in those education forums and really get trusted advice from the resources of the IDF. That's wonderful. And we certainly love the IDF as a clinical immunologist because we feel that it's one of those trusted sources for providing information. And how about social media groups? What's your take on it? Well, I have a mixed relationship with those social media groups. I will tell you that when I was diagnosed in 2001, I had really good advice from my immunologist at the time. He said, focus on the positive. Yes, you have this diagnosis, but we have a really good treatment option for you. And he even said at that time, don't go out there searching for life expectancy and doing a lot of research on your own to come up and figure out what's going to happen to you. 
He said, nobody goes and posts the great things happening in their life while living with an immune deficiency. You're only going to read about the bad stuff. And I really did heed his advice. And that still stuck with me 20 years later when the advent of all kinds of Facebook groups and other things like that exist. Yes, I look at them from time to time, but I also remember that physician's advice when he said, not too many people are going and posting about all the good things that they're doing if they're out doing all of those good things in life. So yes, I have found them valuable, but I've most found valuable is finding my community, even with the help of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, finding like-minded persons who were really focused on living with the disease and it be a part of their life, not their whole life. And to that angle, today I serve as a peer support coach and lead IDF's Get Connected groups for the Houston area. And it's in that that I have encouraged other patients to focus on the positives that come from their diagnosis. And the good things that can happen from building a community and finding like-minded individuals in their patient community that they can chat with and share experiences with. That's wonderful. So what's your advice for patients with immunodeficiency who it's now inevitable that they are going to go online and go to forums and look for information about their disease? I think the most important thing is to look for advice from trusted sources. You and I both mentioned organizations like the Immune Deficiency Foundation as a trusted source. Stick to the trusted source, not the friend of the friend of the friend who said this or the random person who said, oh, I took this great supplement and it cured me or made me feel better. All of those things may be notes that you may want to take and bring back to your doctor to discuss with them, but never should one take that information that they may find online and act upon it without talking to their healthcare provider. Certainly, I know that there are things that I have learned on listening to Immune Deficiency Foundation forums that I have brought up with even Dr. Hajar, you, and said, well, what about this study that's going on here? Do you think I'm a candidate for it, given my history? And you have given me advice of, well, why I am not a candidate for it. So all that goes back to the importance of having that close relationship with one's healthcare team to really talk through those little bits of information you may collect by reading things on the internet from either trusted sources or those random sources you may find. Absolutely. And perhaps we just have to mention that we certainly encourage patient education and we really encourage patients to look up their diseases and to bring up medical questions and even challenge their health care if they are not feeling that they are getting the care that they need, but to as well make sure that they are certain that the information that they are looking at are validated and well vetted because there are a lot of good information, but unfortunately a lot of misinformation is available as well. And you know that's very important when you think about things that are less scientifically studied, for example, like the symptoms and the burden of the disease and the complications that are not very objective and not very measurable, like, for example, fatigue, in which there are a lot of challenges in understanding why patients with immunodeficiency have fatigue. So we encounter a lot of problems about looking at multiple things on the internet that some of them are true, but many of them are not. And uh, we get a lot of patients who come to us and ask us questions about fatigue, certain supplements or behaviors or sometimes expensive machines that uh, will not really add anything to their healthcare. So I wanted to ask you specifically on some of those factors like fatigue and and your take on it and your understanding on it. Well, I have been challenged at various points in my 
illness and chronic disease journey with fatigue. And I have learned some of those aspects that I've I've mentioned earlier about being resilient through those periods of time and knowing that, yes, there will be periods of time where fatigue will definitely set in. But going back to some of the things that I am in control of, like diet and exercise and balancing my energy, which leads me to to know that I will experience fatigue from time to time, but by acting on some of those things that I am in control of, I may be able to influence how I feel through that period of fatigue. And knowing that diet can definitely influence how I feel in that period of time. I know diet is a very tough pill to swallow if someone says they need to change their diet. If it only would be that easy and it be a pill to swallow. But diet takes a lot of focus and change. And and sometimes I say people want to, especially we're recording this podcast in January when diet is everything and about New Year's resolutions and everyone is offering some type of diet. But I try to even encourage others who are faced with a period of time when it may be through fatigue or through a period of illness of focus on adding healthy items into their diet. Eventually, you can add more of those healthy items. And what might happen over that period of time is the less healthy ones will start to fall away. And what do you get? You get a more healthy diet over time. Or having that rainbow of flavors and taste on your plate and make a more colorful plate might be things that maybe even the more colorful plate will just make you inspire you with a little smile or something that makes you happy and get you through a period of time when you are struggling with fatigue. So I know that fatigue is a part of my diagnosis and does happen time to time, but I can, through my concepts of resilience, really bounce back when there are those periods of really low energy and challenges. Absolutely. We, uh, you know, Megan, that I had a specific interest in fatigue and uh, part of my clinical research focused on it because we now know scientifically that fatigue is real in immunodeficiency, but unfortunately we still do not understand the full mechanisms that lay behind it. And in my mind, I break fatigue, uh, influencing factors into factors that we cannot change and factors that we may be able to change and factors that we absolutely can change. And I start with the factors that we cannot change, which is, for example, having the diagnosis. At this point, most of the diagnoses are not curable and they are not preventable. So the fact that having an immune deficiency is associated with fatigue is something we're not able to change. Other factors include demographics of the individual experiencing fatigue. So Multiple studies, not only in immunodeficiency, but other diseases did show that women tend to experience fatigue more than men, maybe due to the fact that women are more willing to share their feelings in studies, or just they have more sensitive you know, feelings towards how they interact. And absolutely in multiple ways, they have more responsibility. So the fatigue burden them more in their social activities. The factors that I say we may or may not be able to influence are dependent on how we understand the fatigue is. So if the fatigue is caused by a thyroid disease dysfunction or loss of vitamin or, you know, a certain clear inflammatory uh, condition that is associated with it and we can control it, we call those reversible factors inducing fatigue and we can try to treat those underlying causes and help improve fatigue. The factors that we definitely can, although it's hard because they are behavioral, are more challenging because they fall on the patient's side much more than the provider side. You've already mentioned several of them, like uh, the exercise that has been shown to be effective. Although a lot of people think that it's counterintuitive, you're asking me to exercise when I'm already feeling very tired. And as well, sunlight exposure, which requires to be consistent. There are a lot of studies that link it to vitamin D, but even in people who are not vitamin D deficient, being exposed to sunlight has been shown to be effective in ways that we don't quite understand. 
having a healthy diet is definitely something that we are all interested in understanding how mechanistically it contributes to the quality of life and fatigue. I have mentioned earlier that one of my translational research projects is focused on microbiome and its interaction with the immune system. And in very broad spectrum, we think about the microbiome is an organ now encompassed of bacteria as a really a metabolic system that metabolize what we eat and turn it into either healthy nutrients or sometimes inflammatory chemicals that can then go from the gut and circulate into our system and even go to the brain. And there are a lot of discussions about the gut-brain axis, which means that there is a direct relationship between the gut with the microbes in it and the metabolites that those microbes produce and the central nervous system and the brain. And it has been linked to multiple mental illnesses, mental symptoms. And part of what we're looking at is linking this to fatigue as well. And I definitely, I want to mention as well, some of the things that our patients might encounter directly that affect their microbiome, like antibiotics and some of the medications that they take that could affect their microbiome. And we, we definitely advise individually patients to uh, maybe take some probiotics or something like that when needed. But of course, this is varies between uh, patient to patient. And I wanted to ask your experience about some of those aspects that I mentioned that help or have affected your health and your diet through your d- disease journey. You and I have personally spoken about the value of probiotics when you are on an antibiotic regimen. So I'm very much have learned from you and follow your advice regarding probiotics. I've also taken a lot of advice from you in terms of using everyday foods like yogurt and kefir to put that as a part of building a healthy gut microbiome. I know my GI system is not one of the star systems of my body and sometimes is the source of a lot of different problems that I face with my own primary immune deficiency. So I've had to learn how to balance my own nutritional needs with what I can tolerate in that period of time. So I have had to learn, you know, what foods do trigger a bad response and how to balance those. And sometimes it's been through trial and error. Other times it's been through kind of reading and learning of what other patients may experience or even trying out with the support of healthcare practitioners, whether it be a registered dietitian who very much knows certain diets and how some specific diet may improve outcomes related to those diseases. Absolutely. And we emphasize here that this is a very individualized advice that should be made between the patient and their provider based on their specific needs. So probiotics may be okay for some people, but may not be okay for others. So we want to emphasize that those advices has to be very personalized and individualized and prescribed by a healthcare provider to a specific patient. So we come to kind of uh, towards the end of our podcast. And if I am to summarize from my end, I would emphasize that health-related quality of life is an important component of patients' life with a chronic illness and specifically in living with primary immunodeficiency disorders. There are multiple factors that can affect health-related quality of life as well as perceived health. A lot of it has to do with how the disease affects the physical activities, the mental health, as well as the social activities of the individual. There are factors that we can have control over, like living a healthier life, having more active physical life, more balanced uh, diet, avoiding certain diets or behaviors that might worsen your overall health, like smoking, excessive alcohol, and things like that, that we did not elaborate on, but definitely intuitive. And there are a lot more to look for in the research world in which we try to understand other factors that we may have overlooked previously that contribute to quality of life. And here, of course, one of my top favorite research projects is 
understanding more the role of the microbiome in the immune system itself and its role in quality of life in patients with immunodeficiency. And with that, Megan, I'd like to thank you again for joining me today. And um, any final comments from your end? Thank you for having me. I think it's important to share these messages around quality of life and the things that patients can do to have control in their own healthcare journey. Thank you, everybody, for listening. The Immune Deficiency Foundation improves the diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life of people affected by primary immunodeficiency through fostering a community empowered by advocacy, education, and research. To learn more, please visit primaryimmune.org.